Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Life Reimagined, Pirkei Avot, Chapter 4, Mishnah 22. This is the last Mishnah in Perek Dalet. Whoop, whoop. So this is a bit of a chazak, chazak, v'nit chazek, um, uh, a, uh, a moment of, uh, of uh, finishing everything that we've done in, all, in the entire, entire chapter, and Bezrat Hashem will start in, ch- in uh, Perek Hay next week. So this Mishnah is epic, like literally epic. Kind of reminds me when I look at this, this Mishnah, so remember that opening scene, I don't even know which one it is from Star Wars or Star Trek or Star, I didn't see any of the movies, but I, the opening scene is very famous in a, in a galaxy far, far away. And it's just like a, the backdrop is of all the stars and the galaxy behind, you know, with these words just kind of talking about, you know, that, so it gives you this wide, open, you know, concept. And I kind of feel like this Mishnah is like that as well. Rabbi Lazar Kapar, he's the previous uh, Mishnah speaker. So when it says, Hu Haya Omer, it's referring to him. Hu Haya Omer. So we're going to take a look, as we always do, first at the Mishnah itself on a quick uh, surface level, and then maybe we'll kind of delve into it a little bit more. But I think to that, today's Mishnah will require from us a bit of a different approach in, uh, in dealing with it. So, uh, buckle up. Hayilodim lamut vehametim lechayot. So, in case you thought you were going to come to a really happy class, we start off by saying Hayilodim, those who are born lamut. At least I made it better. It doesn't say Hayiladim lamut, which means the children should die, but it says Hayilodim, anyone that was born, any person that was born eventually lamut, they will die. Vehametim lechayot, and ultimately. All those that die in Tchiat HaMetim, Lichiot will come back to life. Ve'achayim lidon, and those that are living will be judged, and they will be judged on the fact we were placed here, Leda to know, Ulehodia and to teach, Ulehivada, and to become people who understand, which is a very interesting, uh, you know, triple expression here. Leda means that we should know it. Lehodia means that we should teach to others, lihivada, and to let be known. So to be emissaries and to be examples of this concept. Shehu el, that God is the only uh, uh, deity. Hu hayotzer, he is the creator. Hu habore, different forms of creating. One is bringing into existence and one is fashioning from within an existence. Hu hamevin, he's the one who understands. Hu hadayan, he is the one who judges. Hu ha'ed, he is the witness. Hu ba'al din, he is the, uh, the, uh, the prosecution in terms of the, uh, you know, the prosecuting party. Hu uh, atid ladon. In the end uh, of your time here, both in both states of judgment. So when a person passes, that's one judgment. And then as well, when the world is over, there's the yom hadin agadol v'anora, the great day of judgment, which comes at the end of time, so to speak, before tichiyat emetim, before Mashiach. Who atid ladon, he is eventually going to uh, judge us all. Now, this first part of the Mishnah, what is it telling us? I mean, what's, what's Rabbi Elazar HaKapa, what is he hoping to communicate to us, to tell us everybody dies, and eventually everyone is brought back to life, and when you are brought back to life, there's a, there's a judgment day. There's a time where you're going to be, you know, it, you're going to be called to task for everything that you did, you know. And did you did you know God? Did you teach about God? You know, was God evident, you know, through your actions, even perhaps the people who who did not teach, you know. Remember in this process that God's concept, if you will, our concept of God is one where Hashem is everything. He creates, He's the, he's the judge, He's the witness, He's the baldin. He's the one against you, He's the one for you. It's like, it's uh, overwhelming this Mishnah. It's like so much, but we're still not done yet. <clears throat> Baruch Hu, blessed is He. She'en lefalav lo avla. There's no wrong. Velo shikha, and he, there's no forgetting. Velo masofanim, and no finding favor. Velo mikach shochad, and no bribes. Veda shakol lefi hacheshbon. Everything is done according to the cheshbon, according to the reckoning, okay? Ve'al yevtichacha yetzrecha, and don't let your yetzer think, you know what, all right. 
that, but all that is only till I get judged. But then at least I, you know, if I, you know, he sends me to Gehenam, so I, at least there, there's no more judgment. And that, you know, I'll do my, I'll do my time and then I'll be okay. Don't let your Yetzehara tell you Sha'ashaol Met Banoslach is a place to escape. Sha'al Korchacha Atanotzar, you were created against your will. Ve'al Korchacha Atanolad, and you were you were born against your will. Ve'al Korchacha Atachai, and whether you like it or not, you were alive. Ve'al Korchacha Atamet, and against your will, you die. Ve'al Korchacha Atadivicheshbon. At the end of the day. Whether you like it or not, you're going to give uh, a judgment and a reckoning in front of Melech Malchei Amlachim Makadosh Baruch Hu. God, the King of all kings, uh, blessed be His name. <laughs> so ended the fourth chapter. Uh, anyone would like to jump off the roof now? This is your cue, right? Uh, poison your drink, right? It's very depressing, this Mishnah, isn't it? What is the Mishnah really trying to convey? It's the most nihilistic, perhaps, Fatalist approach, it seems. Doom and gloom, no escaping the end. You know, of course, that is not the aim of the Mishnah. The Mishnah is communicating to us something that is such a deep truth. And perhaps instead of spending the time kind of parsing each part of this Mishnah, I want to perhaps, if I could, take the camera all the way out and try and understand what is he trying to teach us thematically? What is he communicating with us, Aurelia really Zara Kapar, with all of this? And, and in what way can we grow from that knowledge? So I want to focus perhaps on the last thing that he says first, because I think if we turn this sock inside out, we'll be able to kind of see, you know, how the, some socks, there's, you know, there's no, you try and look for the place where they, where did they start? you know, darning the sock. Where's the, where's the seam? So you look at the sock, you don't see anything. If you turn the sock inside out, the sock inside has that one line that if you have sensory children are complaining the whole time, the socks have the line! They go crazy. My dear friend Isaac Ash, one of the things that he does, makes when he makes his Puma socks is he makes them without the line. They figured out a proprietary way of making socks with no line, okay? So, um, if you turn the sock inside out, you find the line. When you find the line, you can kind of find and see the structure of how this was made and how this was put together. And this is no different. I want to look at this one chapter here at the end. You see, the beginning seems to be saying, like, you know, there is an inescapable justice. That's what it seems to be saying in the beginning, right? And then it kind of carries on with the middle part. You see, that's the way I divided this Mishnah, if you look at the way I divided it. Then there's the middle part that says, okay, now that you can't escape the justice, right, um, recognize that there's no bribing that judge. So in other words, everything you've done is counted. It's God paid attention to it. And you can't escape it because the guy who made you, the guy who made the world, you know, there's no one else to turn to. You can't like find someone who knows someone. Every Jewish person always, like I know my uncle has a friend in the embassy, right? So you knowing someone who knows someone, there is no way around this because he's the creator, but he's also, you know, and you think, okay, if he's the creator, maybe he'll be on my side, but he's also the one who understands when you're wrong, like he gets it. He understands the case really well, but then maybe like I could fool the judge, but he's also the judge. And, and okay, fine, then maybe I could kind of, you know, make a deal with the other side. The, you know, the, I can make a deal with, my, with, the, with the people I'm standing against in court and they'll drop the charges. Yeah, but he's also the Baladin. Well, maybe I could pay off the witnesses. He's also the witness. It's like one of those plays from hell that you have to go to in one of your children's high schools, right? Where there's one person who plays all the characters and... You know, it's amazing it's that they play all the characters badly. Either way, the point is, right? So, who atid ladon? So, the first part of the Mishnah seems to be saying the inescapability of the justice of Hashem. The next part says, now that that's all true, you know, can you pay him off? No. Does God, you know, is he corruptible? Avla? You know, can anything be done about that? No. Oh, that's very sweet. Okay. <laughs> you saw something moving, and my first thought was not bird in New York City, by the way. 
And you were going like this, and I wasn't sure if that was like, that's adorable, or I'm going to vomit. So it's amazing how this could kind of be both of those, right? Okay, fine. Yeah, so it seems like that's the first two parts in the Mishnah. But the last part of the Mishnah seems to be saying something very different. Like, against you will you're born, and against you will you die, and against you will you live, get, etc. What is he, what is that? Let's look at the last part of the Mishnah first. You know, there's a great song um, sung by Mordechai ben David. And the song is called, Come With Me, Little Neshamala. Now, I'm not going to do a rendition of the entire song. But there's this unbelievable point in the song. It's just such a mind-bending song. And it's literally this Mishnah. So I'll just give you the lyrics there. This, uh, what's it called? This angel, effectively, or God, whoever's singing the song, says, come with me, little Nishamala, Little Nishama. The soul is in heaven. And there's a place, you know, that you need to go to. Where is it referring to? To this world. And the Nishama says, um, uh, No, I don't want to go. Right? There is so much pain and evil. Upon the earth below, let me stay here where I am. There's so much, right? Okay, so the, at, the neshama is like, heaven is beautiful. I don't want to go. You're telling me about a place, a world, an imperfect world? The soul at that stage, it doesn't want to be born. And then finally, it's chucked into this baby in a mother's stomach, okay? And the baby is so comfortable in the womb. The baby's like, this is awesome. I don't want to leave here. I don't want to go. And then finally, the baby against its will is literally shoved out by the contracting muscles of the mother's stomach, pushed through into this world. And then the baby is now here. And then the baby grows old. And as the baby grows old, the baby says, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave this world. This cycle illustrates that at every single point of human existence, we are resistant to change. And we want things to stay as they are. The soul doesn't want to become a baby. The baby doesn't want to be born. The person who's born doesn't want to die. Right? That's how it works. And the ironic thing is that when then the neshama goes up to heaven again, and it needs to complete its mission, what happens? Our story begins again. Right? I don't want to leave, but you're not, you haven't fulfilled the mission yet. Start again, okay? So we're looking at this reality of uh, humanity's resistance to change, our addiction to comfort, to familiarity. And on some level, we look at it and we kind of see the most myopic version of that familiarity. So as an example, you know, when we need to move from one city to another. I know the stores here, the school, I know my synagogue, I know the people. I don't want to move. You know, I know a guy I was speaking to recently about the fact that they recognize that there just aren't any schools for their children with the ethos that they want to raise their kids in. But it's such a traumatic thing for them to move that every time they talk about it, him and his wife decide that they have to and they don't have a choice. And then immediately following this realization that they have to move and don't have a choice, his wife starts crying again because she doesn't want to move. And then what do they do? They have the conversation which says, but we have to move and there really isn't any choice. Absolutely, we have to. But then she cries about the reality, you understand? It's like the never-ending, this never-ending cycle. And in a certain degree, humanity, all of us, when do we get comfortable with uncomfortable realities? When they shift from our future to our present. So we cry and we moan and we're anxious about how things are going to be. And then when we get shoved into that reality, what happens? Our survival instincts take over. Ki lekach that you were created for this. And suddenly we figure out how to be in this new environment, in this new situation. And then what happens? Right? Singles who love their single life don't want to be married. Right? It's, it's new. Everything's new. We shove away until we get into this new one. And then we love the new reality and then we don't want the next one. Right? So why is it important 
that um, we frame this in al korchacha. Why is that a, a point that's important to the whole beginning of the Mishnah? Who cares if you want it or don't want it? Let's just admit that this is the reality and then whether you like it or not is not relevant to the core theme of this Mishnah, which is the inescapability, the uh, inevitable, inexorable march towards some sort of a judgment day. And the answer, I think, is very, very beautiful. And I think what the Mishnah is trying to do is trying to get us to understand, just like that husband is sitting with his wife, frustrated out of his mind. Right? We've had this conversation, honey, a thousand times. Why are we having this again? It's not like something new is going to come up in this conversation. It's just going to make you upset all over again. And you know what I'm going to answer you. And I know what you're going to answer back. And then you know what I'm going to answer back to your answer back. We've had this conversation a thousand times. Can we just cut to the end? Where you cry and then I say, don't worry, it will be okay. Right? That annoying cycle is really what the Mishnah over here is trying to circumnavigate. Human beings are eternal complainers. We complain about everything. Everything. And sometimes, like, if you can, if you can get out of the situation or out of the space you're in, you realize how ridiculous you sound. <laughs> I just have to give you one example. My son Yitzchak, he's, he's very funny. He's a funny kid. So he gets bored. For children, hell hath no fury like a 10-year-old boy who is bored. So bored. Ah, so bored. What should I do? I'm bored. Unbelievable. Right? So I still remember on Pesach, we went away to Pesach, to one of the maybe, I don't know, maybe the most beautiful place I've ever been to on earth. Okay? Gorgeous. Beautiful. The water, the beach, the weather, everything. <laughs> and he's sitting in the, in the room. He doesn't have his, you know, his best friends are not there. Sitting in the room. <laughs> I'm so bored! So, ugh, I, why do we have to come here? Torture. This island is torture. <laughs> if you know Yitzchak, though, it's like so. And then he does this thing. Where, I don't know. If you guys have children like this. Have you seen the children that just do the most unbelievable impression of liquefying metal melting? Yeah, have you seen that? Yeah. Right? So it's not like, oh, it's like, oh. <laughs> 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 this island is torture. No, we don't take him all that seriously because he also was running around in a pair of white pants that he then got a grass stain on. And he was like, oh, I can't live in white pants. <laughs> 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 to which we all immediately broke out into a rendition of, I can't live if living is in white pants. Which he did not find funny at all. People love to complain. And if you pull the camera out for a second, look at how blessed you are, how wonderful, how amazing your life is. But there's this idea that people have that if I didn't choose this, this is bad. Why do we have to come here? I didn't choose to come here. You chose to come here. Yeah? The whole second part of the Mishnah is trying to reset the balance here. It's trying to say, how do you want your life to look? Because ultimately, there are so many things in this life that you will have zero control over. 
So you could hate your life. You could be upset all the time. You could be angry and bitter and cynical and negative and, right? You could do that if you want. Because this didn't work out the way you wanted and this person is not acting in the way that you hoped and that person didn't say the right thing and this person should have been more supportive and that person should have been, right? That's how you could be. Or you could recognize that this world was not created for you to have things the way you want them. It was created for you to have things the way you need them. So the Mishnah changes the game. It flips the script and says to us, recognize, you don't create yourself. Hu ha-yotzer. Hu ha-bore. He's the one who understands. You don't understand. You think you understand. Hu ha-mevin. I think I need this. Hashem's like, nope. You need white pants. <laughs> but they're so annoying. And they're so, they get dirty so easily. And then I look so stupid so quickly. And we say that about our personalities. Why was I created with this personality? Why was I created with these parents or these, these family members? Right? Or, or, or anything that we live with or live in. But who ha mevin? And who had Dayan ultimately recognize that there's only one part that you play in this world. Only one thing that you do get. You want to choose something? No problem. Let's first get everything that you don't choose off the table. I'll never forget that I had a, uh, uh, two family members We were very upset at each other. I hadn't spoken for a very long time. This one was upset that that one did this, and that one was upset that that one did that, and it was terrible, terrible, terrible. Okay? Anyway, they come to my house, and I sat down, and for the first 10 minutes, I forbade them from saying one word. And I spent 10 minutes. What was I talking about? For 10 minutes. I spoke about all the problems that we weren't going to solve today. We're not going to solve your problem with him and you know, we're not going to solve what happened in the business deal with this and we're not going to deal with this and we're not going to talk about that and we're not... 10 minutes I spent taking everything off of the table that was not on the agenda for today. And that if my deal with them was that if any of them mentions any of the things that I said in the first 10 minutes, I get to punch them. I threw a lot of punches that day, by the way, until the end of that meeting when they, when they hugged each other and made up. And I did it by effectively copying this Mishnah. Let me, let me narrow the field of vision to what the actual conversation is about. There's a million things that you cannot do and you have no choice and you have no power and you have no agency over. Let's take those off the table. So let's only talk about what you do have the power to talk about, what you do have the power to deal with, what you do have the power to change. There are things that I can't. And the Dayan is also the Mevin. So when you first read this Mishnah, it's almost like Hashem is like pinning you slowly but surely against the wall. Who had Dayan? Oh no. Who had Yotzer? Who had Ed? Who had, right? But now when we look at the Mishnah through the end first, we realize the Mishnah is saying exactly the opposite. So there's really only one thing you need to focus on. It's not about staying alive. It's not about that. It's not about coming back to life. Whether you like it or not, you're entering into this world. Whether you like it or not, you're leaving it. So obviously, your purpose in life is not staying alive eternally. That's not working. So what is your purpose? If everything is heading towards a judgment day, surely your purpose in life is preparation for said judgment day. 
Well, what is going to be judged on Judgment Day? What is Hashem going to call me to the table for? What is He going to take me to task for? What's He going to ask me? Is He going to ask me why I'm not married? I was trying, so that not. Because you know what? The same Dayan that told you have this mitzvah, he also was an eyewitness to your entire life. You know in court, when someone says that someone stole something from somebody else, they bring a witness and the witness is the alibi. So you know what's going to happen in Shammai? And Hashem is going to say, how come, this, how, can, how come you didn't give loads of money to Sadaqah? Sorry, I would like to call the witness to this, to this witness stand. Uh, Your Honor, Hashem, the judge, if I could just call the witness, Hashem, the witness <laughs> to the witness stand, right? And Hashem, because he's above space and time, sits on the stand of the witness stand and as the judge at the same time. But he's also at the prosecution table, right? So Hashem's everywhere. He's playing all the parts. And Hashem says, absolutely, I can confirm <laughs> that this person had no more tzedakah to give. I confirm that this person tried their hardest to get married or to have children or to uh, forgive the person where they were incapable of forgiving. Is there such a thing to be incapable of forgiving someone? Absolutely. flipping lutely Because the nature of Judgment Day is only what is possible for you to choose. That's it. Huha mevin. He knows the trauma you went through. And I always think about this. We've spoken many times about uh, Holocaust survivors that managed to decide in their hearts to forgive their tormentors. You think Hashem doesn't know? Why did He do that? Why did they forgive them? Because they forgave them? No. Why did they forgive them, Rani? So they could live. So they could walk around and, and, and be able to breathe, right? You think in Shamaim that Nazi's going to get there and he's going to be like, well, <laughs> I have a signed forgiveness here from uh, Mrs. Hashem is the Mevin. He understands why that person forgave. And I think sometimes people, they kind of feel like something was done to me. I was wronged. How could I forgive or move on? I don't, I, I don't want them to get away with it. Hu ha mevin. Hu ha ed. Hu ha dayan. And I think to myself sometimes that this creator, he's also the executioner. The people who need to get paid back, don't worry, he'll pay them back. That's, not, that's also not in your remit. It's not in your choice wheelhouse so what is in our choice wheelhouse sorry our attitude good our attitude is a massive thing that we need to be choosing every day that is not al korchacha it's not against my will i use my free will to decide my attitude today correct good I mean, again, I always point this out. One of the nicest things about meeting survivors, I said this in our live on Yom HaShoah, is that you get to see the power of the human, of human will. The, the power of human resilience. Where they are capable of deciding to move forward when they have every right in the world to just say, forget it, I'm checking out. And they did it. How much... How much of that has to stand as Musar to all of us to think about how strong we are potentially in these situations and in the scenarios in our lives. So the Mishnah is really communicating to us this idea that in Shamaim, Borei Olam is going to ask us and he's going to know exactly if we had any more in the tank. So I wanted to try today in our little... Uh, workshop experience here to try and imagine <clears throat> two things and I like choosing two things because when you say one thing people are like I can't I don't know which is the biggest so I'll give you two that way it's not the biggest you don't have to decide which is the biggest you want to use three so you have a deflection tool use three when we played Monopoly as kids it was a get out of jail free card. Remember that one? When you played Uno, 
there was a skip or a uh, or a collect four card, right? And you kind of always held it for that moment when the person only has one card, right before they're about to say Uno. By the way, Uno teaches children to be cruel. Think about the joy that you see on kids' faces when that guy's about to win. You're like, boom, double four. Kid bounces back to me. Double two, double four. Reverse, reverse, skip, the, the, seven. Oh no! <laughs> the cruelty that children learn from Uno is unbelievable. Okay. So you know when you hold that card? The get out of jail card, get out of jail free card? You hold the plus four card for that moment? I want you to imagine you had three get out of jail free cards that were blue and three get out of jail free cards that were red. The blue ones are milchigs, are milky. <laughs> the red ones are fleshigs, they're meaty. The blue ones are for mitzvot that you should have done that you didn't do. Positive commandments. And the red ones are fleshigs, are sins that you did that you shouldn't have done. And I, I'm gifting you these six cards for your day of final judgment and reckoning. <laughs> right? Okay. What are you using them for? You can choose in your thought experiment to place these cards on specific stories, something that happened in occurrence, or you could use them in your thought experiment for more general, like uh, midot, a character trait. It's a fascinating example. Just the get out of jail free card, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, I forget the word in English now. COVID brain fog. Yeah? Not a test. No, the, uh, not, not like a test. Not an option. No. It's, it's a, a way of measuring or figuring. Huh? No, no, no. It'll come to me probably in the middle of something else where it's not relevant anymore. Okay? Um, theory, no. It doesn't matter. Yeah? This is a great way of testing yourself. Sorry? It is a method, yeah, but no, it's not the word I'm looking for. Experiment, Experiment better, we're closer. Um, this is a great thought experiment. I used that word already, but that wasn't the one. There's a word I'm, it's, uh, it's just slipping my mind. Either way, huh? Yeah, also, but not, it's not that there's a right word and a wrong word. There's a word that, I, that is just beyond my consciousness right there. It's floating off of the cliff, kind of like Wiley E. Coyote, but it hasn't fallen yet. Okay, so it's right there, but I, that, anyway, the word I'm looking for is, is eluding me. But the point is that there's, this is a great experiment to be able to see what it is that I need to fix. Okay? So, can anyone give us an example of something that they know for sure they would need to use a get out of jail free card on. This is why the recording does not get shared publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Giving enough tzedakah. Giving enough tzedakah, that's a good one. A lot of people are guilty of that, right? Sorry? Anger. Anger. Or judgment. Well, judgment. Right? I think everybody, you know, the, the, the Pasuk says, Lev yodea marat nafsho. Every heart knows its own bitterness. You know, for some people it might be, I wish I was less judgy. Another way of looking at this is, instead of thinking about it in the crime and punishment, in the, uh, you know, in the courtroom analogy, would be to imagine you had a magical wand that you could tap on your own head and just change about yourself, just instantaneously. What would you instantly change about yourself? Right? It's a fascinating way of looking at this. And this really is what the Mishnah, I think, is encouraging. It's telling you, look at all these doors. Almost all of them are shut. 
You can't change this or this or this or this. So which doors are your options? Where can we go? And I think also that the Mishnah is teaching us a deeper truth, but I want, I want, some, I want some examples first from people. And I want to kind of try and like parse it a little bit. And then you'll see what I think the Mishnah is telling us as well. Yeah. Magic wand. Are you magic wanding yourself? So the change, which change is the part? The part is when you're not doing that, you mean? So let's, if we had to, if we had to, that would be a patient compassion. So that is a patient compassion. Sorry? Okay, so there we go. That's a good example. So what you wish you could change was that I can find, I can build up the compassion for like a couple seconds, but I can't stay there. So even if I can kind of tell myself, we just learned in the class about not judging. Okay, I'm not judging, not judging, not judging. Judging! <laughs> right? So I could pull it off for a little while and then it's just, yeah. So that's patient compassion. Okay? Okay, now you, you, you ended with the magic words. I don't know if that's possible, right? I don't know if that's possible. So I would like to never judge anyone ever. And if you remember when we learned the Mishnah that says, judge everyone, every person favorably, right? There was a very powerful line there, super powerful. My rabbi said, why are we telling you to judge people favorably and not telling you not to judge them at all? Do you remember the answer that my rabbi gave? So, so, so it should say don't judge. Well, the Mishnah says judge favorably, but wouldn't it be better if it just said don't judge at all? Huh? In other words, so in put paraphrasing exactly what you said, that's impossible. <laughs> so it is impossible to tell you not to judge. So what we're going to tell you is if you're going to judge, judge favorably. Like they did it wrong, but this is why they did it wrong. Okay? So my rabbi's answer was because let's be real. What that means is it's impossible to not judge. So a lot of times we're really down, we're really upset at ourselves. Because we really want to not be judgy at all. But the Mishnah tells you that that's impossible. So the Mishnah is saying, the same way it says, Al -kor -chacha, against your will you're born, against your will you judge. So don't be upset and down on yourself and give up because, oh, I'm such a judgy person anyway. No. Work on the part that you can do. You're going to judge? judge favorably. You can't judge favorably, 
judge more favorably than you're currently judging. They are horrible, but they don't know better. <laughs> right? Wouldn't it be ideal? No judgment is they're not horrible. <laughs> judgment is they're horrible, but they're probably having a bad day. Right? C could we get it? Could we dial a little bit better than that? Not they're horrible, but they're having a bad day, maybe. They're horrible. And, and they don't know better because they're horrible people. No, they don't know better because they, were, they weren't raised with role models that taught them that this is how they should be. You know, I always, I had once a couple and, um, and I was very close with the, with the uh, young man because, you know, he became religious, you know, through us, very close with him in our house. He got married and he struggled a lot with his wife and her understanding of Judaism and her connection to Judaism. It was very simplistic. It wasn't inspired. She couldn't be bothered to do a lot of the things that he wanted to do and la la la. And I said to him, you know, I know that you, you you're, like, your, your high horse is very high. I said, but how religious were you? I mean, I'm sorry to do this to you, but how religious were you before you met me? I said, were you more or less religious than she is now before you met me? He said, I was less religious, I didn't know anything. I said, and why did, you, why did you become religious? He said, because, you know, you taught, I liked the way you speak, I, da, 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 I could see, it was relatable, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, did she have a rabbi like that? He said, no, she just had, a, you know, Sunday, Jewish Sunday school. Uninspiring, she didn't have a good education. I said, so you're holding against her the fact that she didn't have a rabbi like this? in her life? How is that her fault? So instead of judging the person, maybe figure out how to find in your neighborhood a rabbi or a rebbitzin that she could connect to so she could have the experience you had so that the outcome that you're searching for happens not by brute force but by osmosis. All the time in our lives we're banging on doors that we cannot open. Then we're getting upset at the doors for not opening. The world, through the eyes of a person who understands this, is a different world. Not just in terms of their happiness, but also in terms of their spirituality. I had someone a little while ago, actually, it wasn't a little while ago, it was yesterday. Time moves very, very, very quickly when you're having fun. <laughs> it's yesterday. This is a boy. It's a boy who became quite religious quite quickly. Spent some time in yeshiva. And the yeshiva wasn't doing him any favors. It was too much. It was too much. It was too fast. And he wanted more, but it was killing him. He couldn't reconcile it with his relationship with his family. His, like, he, he started, you know, things started taking their toll on him psychologically. Like, you know, he felt, you know, guilty about all the things that he wasn't doing. It was not a good situation. And I basically commanded him to come home from yeshiva. His words, not mine. The way he perceived our conversations was that I commanded him to come home from yeshiva. And he thanked me yesterday for, say, his words was, saving his life. Now, I want to just look at this for one second together. You'd think that the greatest path or clearest path towards growing in spirituality is Spending time in the yeshiva, correct? Not leaving it. You'd think, perhaps, that being in a, in a city like Brooklyn, where there's far more opportunities to be able to uh, be part of a synagogue or religious schools, you'd think that that would result automatically in a person living a more religious lifestyle. But that's not always the case. It isn't always the case. 
Sometimes the case is exactly the opposite. Do you hear that? But it, it takes recognizing that this path in front of me that I want so badly to go on, I just can't. I can't. I'm not there. That actually causes the greatest level of growth in the world. So as an example, a person who's not ready to cover their hair or not ready to go fully kosher because their husband's not there and their, well, their wife is not there and, and doing this is going to cause such a disruption to their life. I'm going to give you an example. There was a scenario that was brought in front of uh, Revel Yashiv. You have a guy, he's married to a non-Jewish woman, Jewish man, starts learning about Judaism. It's day three. He's loving it. Can he be married to someone who's not Jewish according to Jewish law? No. Is it the rabbi's obligation to communicate to him that being married or staying in a marriage to someone who is not Jewish is a absolute impossibility in Judaism on day three? Now, if he asks you, what's the law? You can't lie. You can't not say. You can't say it's okay. That's Asur. But is, if the person is not yet ready to be introduced to that, then the irony is this spiritual idea doesn't help them. It destroys them. Judaism becomes the source or the single greatest source of their unhappiness. Are we understanding this? There are times that a person needs to recognize, I can't do this. This is al korkacha This is not my door. And the same God that you're so worried will judge you. Hua Dayan, Hua Mevin, he understands. And I always love this. Why does the judge why is God, who is the judge, understand, become the one who is understanding? Because like we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in the prayers, V'yavin kol yitzur ki ata yitzarto. And you understand every creation. Ki ata yitzarto. Because you created it. Prayer on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is this Mishnah. I'm standing in front of the judge, in front of the witness, but I say, God, you understand my failings and my challenges. You understand them. Not just because you're witnessing them, but because you made them. You made them. The Mishnah is encouraging us to stop the BS, pardon my French, in us understanding and recognizing ourselves. Don't lie to yourself who you are. Now today, that concept of self-confidence is associated with some sort of narcissistic false self-image. So in order to feel good about yourself, what do you need to tell yourself? You're perfect. You're perfect. You're amazing. You're wonderful. That's what they tell the kids. You're great. You're a winner. You're the best. That's not self-confidence. That's a lie. And that is only doomed to bring a person to their knees because in the moments when they recognize that they aren't perfect, they suddenly feel not just not perfect, but of zero confidence. Because the only thing that they will accept of themselves and the only thing that's good is something which is perfect. But that's not how God made you. And you don't get to choose your character traits or your life situation or the mistakes that you made, those you chose to do. But you don't get to choose now to undo them. That is your past. You have your baggage. What do you do with it now that that is the case? A person can have self-confidence 
and not be perfect. I can achieve, I can do, I can make good choices, I can do good things. Not perfect things, I can do good things. And what is the definition of good things? Good choices, good deeds. Good deeds are measured on my very own personal Richter scale. Because everything I couldn't choose and everything I currently can't choose is off the table. So every sin that you ever did in your life previously is no longer on the table of al Chacha. Do you understand the power of that thought? Yes, it was your choice to do them when you did them. And yes, at the end of time, God's going to count each and every positive and negative commandment. And when it said God does not take a bribe, Rambam explains, what do you mean God does not take a bribe? What are you going to do, slip him a hundred? It means God's not going to take your mitzvahs as a bribe. You stole something? Don't bring me a korban. Return the money. You hurt someone's feelings? Don't come on Yom Kippur fast and beat your chest. Go apologize to them and make it right. But in this moment, my choice is not to have not hurt you. That's gone. That's al kor My choice now is what do I do with what I am with this moment? And Borei Olam understands that the trajectory you're trying to go on in your imperfect self is beautiful because he made you imperfect. He made you imperfect. He made you imperfect. Do you understand that? God, you're upset at me, you're, you feel bad about your anger or your judginess. God made you judgy. He made you angry. He made you unforgiving and he made you impatient. And he didn't give you a choice in that matter. He gave you a choice to change it within your capabilities. You know, <clears throat> the Dubna Magad gives a very interesting and funny example. And with this I'll end. There was a guy who had two daughters. One that was the ugliest girl you could ever imagine. And the other one that had the foulest mouth you could ever imagine. She was negative and she would curse and she was, you know. Try to marry them off, forget it. No one. Finally, he's a wealthy man. He finds a Shad Khan who's supposed to be amazing. He says, I'll pay you anything. The guy says, okay, but look, whoever I bring, they've got to go on a date. The guy says, okay. Shows up two days later with two guys. One guy who's blind and one guy who's deaf. <laughs> a match made in heaven. Like the blind guy, wow, she's wonderful, she's so nice, she's so kind, can't see what she looks like. The deaf guy, right, can't hear her potty mouth. Time goes on, you know, these people make a life for themselves, they do well in their business, they're be themselves very, uh, you know, wealthy. And then one day, uh, a world famous doctor comes through the town talking about his miracle cures, and they say, well, we'll pay you anything if you could heal our sight and our hearing. Doctor says, okay, it's gonna be a lot of money. So no backsies, right? They, um, they, yeah, they sign a contract, this, that, and the other, uh, for services rendered, for healing us, we'll pay you this fortune of money. He gives the sight to the person, he gives the hearing to the other person, unbelievable. Amazing, okay? Day comes, guy, opens his eyes, looks at his wife. Ah! <laughs> right? Guy opens up his ears. He says, wow, honey, I can hear. And she's cursing at him. He's like, whoa. The doctor comes, end of the day. He says, thank you very much. I'm so glad it worked out. Uh, please remit payment. And they refuse to pay. Ruined our lives. Instead over there, we're paying you for being healed. You destroyed our lives. They go to court. They sit in the bed, Dean. And each side presents their case. 
And the rabbi says, listen, you know, they did say, didn't say, they didn't say, it gen- they didn't say it specifically, they said generally. They want to be healed. You broke them even more. My ruling is, they don't have to pay. The, the other, you know, the doctor's looking at him. The rabbi's got a little smile on his lips. He says, they don't have to pay. And because they don't have to pay, you are allowed to administer a drug that will reverse the procedure. This guy won't see anymore, and this guy won't hear anymore. What'd they say? No, 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 no. No one's taking away my sight. No one's taking... The rabbi said, oh, so pay. (laughs) Small rabbi, right? I think that story is our life. Borei Olam creates us with our unique set of circumstances, our problems, our issues. But he also creates with us the elements that we need in order to be able to succeed in, the, in that life. You know, we, we have the courage or the patience or the whatever that we need to deal with that wife or that husband or that kid or that business or that problem or that world or that community, right? Everybody is built to be able to survive their world. And we complain all the time. And Hashem says, okay. Okay, so let me take away. Your life is so horrible you're complaining about. Me ta- no, 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 I want to stay here. If you want to stay here, you're saying that on balance, you're happy with your challenges, right? With your difficulties and your positives. If you're saying you would choose, now pay for it. Every complainer should hear this mashal of the Dubna Magi. You know? And I think um, when we understand the words of Eliezer Kapar, the widening, the wide view of our world and our responsibilities, it just kind of shrinks to something which is, in the first instance, so depressing. But when you look at it properly, it's actually so invigorating. Like, this is my job right here. That's it, right here. I'm a rabbi of a shul. I have to be the rabbi. Do I have to be this and 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 this? Maybe I'm choosing to be a graphic designer and a you know an events coordinator and a you know and a Shabbat host and a psychologist. Maybe I'm doing all these things. But what is? Imagine someone said to me, "We're hiring all of those jobs. All you need to do is just the rabbi lane." Is that depressing or liberating? It's liberating. Could you imagine that your job in this world was really small, only to focus on one thing, shutting the doors that you can't make a difference in and opening the doors that you can as much as you can. That's it. A great way to start is by using the method, experiment, litmus test of the get out of jail free card or the magic wand. And that's a great place to start in this procedures, in, this, uh, in these options. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen amen. Great to see everybody again. We're looking forward to starting uh, chapter 5 next week. Uh, chazak, chazak, v'nit chazek. Think about all we've been through in, these, in, in chapter 3, chapter 4. Chapter 3 and 4 spanned from before Corona all the way straight through Corona until now. Chapter 5, hopefully, by next week, should be a very different chapter, hopefully. Uh, No masks, indoors, whatever we need, inshallah, we should be blessed. But if it's not indoors, then we won't complain. And then we'll deal with whatever it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends our way.